Buckle your seatbelt. It's time for another episode of the Prepper Recon Podcast. I've personally been buying gold and silver from JM Bullion for over two years. They offer the best prices over spot that I can find, and I've never had a problem with an order. If you're looking to trade in some of your fiat paper for real money, check out jmbullion.com today. Ready-Made Resources is a trusted name in the Prepper community because they've been around for 18 years. They offer great prices on night vision, water filtration, long-term storage food, solar energy components, and provide free technical service. Get ready for an uncertain future at readymaderesources.com. Today's guest is Tim Young of selfsufficientman.com. Tim, welcome back to the show. Thanks, Mark. It's a pleasure to be here. Oh, absolutely. And now, uh, far newer listeners... Uh, because it's been a little while since you've been on the show, probably far too long. Uh, but can you tell us what your blog is all about? Yeah, I mean, my passion is just trying to inspire as many people as possible to go out and find, you know, the piece of self-sufficiency that's right for them. Um, you know, um, it was about 10 years ago that I opted out of what I call the rat race. I mean, I used to be corporate executive, you know, entrepreneur, you know, flying on airplanes, uh, sitting in cubicles, fighting in traffic, and you know, I went the route of going out and starting a sustainable farm and, uh, you know, you know, raising grass-fed beef and pasture poultry and all of those kind of things. And from there, I went to becoming an artist and cheesemaker. And what I really found was that my passion was homesteading and living as self-sufficiently as possible. And uh, it's a great life. I mean, I've kind of been on both sides of the fence, Mark. I've been on the corporate world, and I've been out here kind of in the boondocks, if you will. And, you know, what you find in this lifestyle is a lot of you know, freedom, a lot of independence, a lot of safety, a lot of security, those kind of feelings. And, uh, you know, my mission is to inspire as many people as possible to grab as much of that as they can. And you just mentioned uh, shortly there that, that you that you are out of the corporate world and uh, you've actually got a pretty long resume. Can you talk to us a little bit about where you've been and the process that got you to where you are now? Yeah, it's funny how things, you know, go full circle and you don't really understand why. I mean, one of the th- uh, the publications I see people talk about, you know, a lot of times in the um, self-sufficiency world is, um, you know, an old uh, books or magazines called Foxfire. And Foxfire was a publication that was uh, put out um, in a, uh, you know, by students of a North Georgia high school. And as it turns out, I was in that high school and I wrote for Foxfire for two years back, you know, in the, ni- in the late 1970s when I was in high school. But from there, You know, I went out into the corporate world and, you know, worked in marketing and advertising businesses for, you know, 20 some odd years and became an entrepreneur along the way and founded my own business. I mean, a real, you know, fast growing company that, you know, had hundreds of employees in five, six countries and, um, you know, just traveling all over the world doing the kind of stuff that you do for high tech firms. But, um, you know, I don't know how it happens. You, you, You reach some point in your life where you have a realization and uh, my realization kind of came, you know, you know, maybe 2004, 2005 or so when I sl- it slowly dawned on me that, um, you know, I didn't really you know what I was doing wasn't what I would call real. Um, I didn't, it's hard to explain to people or to my mother or to a kid what it was that I was doing. And that kind of happened at the same time that I became aware of n- not knowing where my food came from or how it was produced. And there was a whole movement at that time with books like The Omnivore's Dilemma and those kind of things that, you know, influenced me and a number of other people to say, wait a minute, you know, this seems pretty perilous. I mean, um, I've abdicated all of my self-sufficiency or survival, you know, requirements to this machine. You know, I go to the grocery store to get groceries. I go to a restaurant to get food. I I depend on somebody for a paycheck. Um, You know, I depend on doctors to, you know, give me pills or tell me what's wrong with me or those kind of things. And, you know, I, I guess I didn't react rationally when I found out about that. A rational response might have been to keep doing what I was doing and go to a farmer's market or something. But instead, uh, my wife and I just said, let's just pull the plug and opt out. And so we left, you know, we had a home on a golf course back then, just, you know, like a typical suburban life, um, cul-de-sac, homeowners association, all that kind of stuff. And we left and went out and bought 126 acres in the middle of nowhere, three hours from Atlanta at the time. And just said, we're going to start farming. And, um, you know, that was the route we took. And uh, since then, like I said, we've evolved from there into more uh, pull back into more of just homesteading for us. We still raise, you know, chickens, pigs, rabbits, you know, goats, cows, those kind of things. But we don't do that commercially. We do that more for our own preparedness and for our own lifestyle. 
and then you're going to be launching a podcast in addition to the blog. Is that right? Yeah, I mean, I put this notion off for about a year. I've been kicking it around for about a year because I've had a podcast before years ago. Um, but, you know, I've been intrigued by the idea of having a podcast that features stories of other people who in one way, shape, or form are embracing um, a prepared or self-sufficient life. You know, and there's a lot of podcasts out there that are excellent, uh, like yours, for example. They're excellent at uh, interview shows. Um, but what I wanted to do was take a different twist and, um, and you know, take the story of the people I'm talking to and then narrate it. Uh, so it's not all their words. It's a mixture of their words and my interpretation of their story. And the reason I wanted to do that show is it's just another way that I can reach and try to inspire an audience to, hey, get out of the rat race, get out of traffic, get out of your cubicle, and go out there and live the life that you want to live. So, yeah, the uh, podcast launches uh, September uh, 2016. It's called Self-Sufficient Life. Oh, I think that's that's an absolutely fantastic idea, and and I love the idea of uh, of mixing it up a little bit like that. I'm sure it's going to be uh, a little more intense as far as our production time, but I'm sure it's going to be very very well worth it. Yeah, it's a lot of work actually to do it. I found that out doing the first few episodes, and I almost immediately questioned myself because I said, "Oh man, you've got to create multiple tracks, and uh, you know, first you do the hour, hour ten minute interview, whatever it may be." Then I, you know, print out a transcript of it and I go through and kind of circle the key elements and try to weave together what I think the story is. Because the truth is, most of us don't know what our stories are. I mean, if you ask me what my story is, you know, I just kind of give you a chronological, you know, set of events of what's happened. But, you know, I'm trying to find out what the tipping point is for people, why they make the decisions they do, how they react, you know, in certain situations when they, you know, find obstacles or they find a spouse that's not on board or, you know, they find they have budgetary constraints or a big problem, you know, that people have when they're looking for a self-sufficient life that I'm trying to uncover is they're trying to figure out how to make money. I mean, I hear a lot of people say, yeah, I would love to leave what I'm doing and go live more self-sufficiently, but how do you afford to take the leap? So I guess kind of the heart of the show and the interviews is, you know, I'm trying to find out how are people finding ways to monetize their lifestyle so they can live out there the way they do? And then I think the format that you're talking about, it sounds to me a lot like what Serial did. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I'm definitely influenced by Serial, NPR, those kind of things. I have to tell you, you know, when you sit down and try to do an episode like the ones I'm doing, uh, you really have a lot of respect for the, uh, for the uh, uh, for production talent and uh, the the, uh, the, the uh, resources and processes they have in place because you'll do your first few like I'm doing and you go, oh, man, I, I'm just awful at this. I mean, and, and those people are really fantastic at it. But, you know, I'm a one-man guy. Um, you know, I'm, I'm on the phone with people. I'm doing interviews, and I'm doing it all in GarageBand on a Mac. So um, I'm doing my best to do that and hopefully can present it in a way that's entertaining for people that, that they can listen to it when they're, <laughs> ironically, you know, fighting traffic going to work. And then they can uh, be at work all day thinking about it going, man, I need to get out of here. Well, it just sounds really, really interesting to me. And I just I, I can't wait to, uh, to start listening. We're going to take a quick break and we'll be right back. Katie Armor offers affordable body armor, including level three trauma plates made of AR 500 steel. They can endure multiple rounds from pistols and rifles up to 7.62 NATO. Order today from katiearmor.com. That's C-A-T-I armor.com. Following a crippling EMP attack against the USA, college student turned survivalist Danny Walker finally makes it to his secure rural location. No sooner does Danny arrive than he is given another petrifying prophetic vision of the chaos still to come. The country has been brought to its knees and the thin veneer of civility has been torn to shreds by the savagery lurking just below the surface. Danny has survived the EMP, but will he live through the most vicious era in U.S. history? By Ichabod, book two of Seven Cows, Ugly and Gaunt. From Amazon.com today in Kindle, paperback, or audio edition. Back to the homesteading. Can you give us sort of your definition of modern homesteading? Yeah. Um, 
It's a great question, Mark. Uh, and you hear modern, you know, homesteading, you know, thrown out there now, you know, more and more. Um, you know, the essence of homesteading is having, you know, a, a decent uh, level of self-reliance. So you have the ability to take care of yourself. Now, I'm not one of these people at all that believes in the concept of total self-sufficiency. There's just no way. I'm not going to perform my own heart surgery, for example. So we're all going to be reliant on other people for some things. But, you know, if you think about the basic necessities of life, I want to have shelter. I want to have the ability to uh, to provide heat and warmth. I want the ability to provide food. Um, I want the ability uh, to uh, to forage and those kind of things. You know, for me, that requires a little bit of land and the ability to do that. That's kind of the difference between a quote unquote pure prepper and someone who's a homesteader. I mean, it, you can be, I guess, in the city and have supplies and be a pure prepper, but not necessarily have the resources at your disposal to be self-reliant homesteader. So, you know, we have that piece of land. Um, you know, we have the ability to raise chickens and rabbits for ourselves and for for meat and milk goats and raise cows and, of course, hunt deer and there's deer and turkey everywhere. I mean, Mark, it's free food. You know, and, you know, people are paying, I don't know what they're paying for meat in the grocery store. Uh, you know, beef I know is expensive. I don't know what they're paying because I haven't bought meat in the grocery store in over 10 years, but Either, when you have a homestead, all of that's out there available to you. Now, the modern aspect of homesteading is this. There are people like me who want to live that life, but they still want to have direct TV. They still want to have high-speed Internet because there's a lot of cool things on YouTube. And, you know, Mark Goodwin might be out there talking on the Prepper Recon, and he might want to download his videos or his podcasts. Their modern homesteaders also want to make money. They don't, they don't need to go out and buy you know, all kinds of shiny stuff. That's not the way they are. I mean, people like me wear the same clothes every day and maybe change them every two or three days, you know, and they get in the clothes they do wear, they get them at goodwill, but they like earning income and they like the ability to travel or do things if they want to. So modern homesteaders are trying to find creative ways to earn income. So the people I interview, you know, on the podcast, they make money anywhere from traditional farmstead products, like they make cheese or they make soap or they sell pastured meats or, you know, homestead crafts or those kind of things to very non-traditional ways. They monetize podcasts. They monetize blogs. Uh, as you know, they, uh, they write books and they make money through writing books. Um, they have, they're part of affiliate programs. They do affiliate marketing. They do online courses. Um, they, um, they sell essential oils. There's a lot of ways today that you can make money without going to quote unquote, you know, a job. You can do that from home and live a very independent self-sufficient life. And I guess one other part of modern homesteading I've noticed is that modern homesteaders tend to homeschool their children and be preparedness oriented. And we certainly fit both those criteria. We're, we're homeschoolers and you could tell, definitely call us preppers as well. And, uh, you, you talked to, you touched on this a little bit, but, uh, I, I think that there's a lot of folks that when, when they move out of the city, they do what you did and, and they go by the land and uh, is there sort of this romantic notion for a lot of folks that when they first move out, they're going to produce 100 percent of, of everything they consume? And and uh, how long does it take for for reality to set in on that? Well, you know, it, it takes as long as for you to try to grow your first crop of um, oats or wheat and or, or put it this way, rice, if you like rice, which I do, and find out, wow, OK, some of these things are really hard. And, you know. Early on, I mean, we produced everything. I mean, I have raised, um, in terms of for myself and for other people, we have raised guineas, turkeys, ducks, uh, geese, uh, chicken, uh, beef cows, dairy cows, uh, goats, uh, sheep, uh, you name it. Um, and we've also grown pretty much, you know, as many grains and vegetables as you can you can think of. But when I grew oats and rice, I said, yeah, I can do it, but I can. You can adequately store uh, wheat if you do it the right way, and I know you know this, for 30 years. So why in the world do I want to do that? I mean, so we have got buckets and, you know, buckets of six-gallon buckets of uh, wheat kernels put aside and stored properly in Mylar bags that are going to last us for a long time. And we have both electric and hand grain, uh, hand crank grain mills. So, you know, we can turn that into flour. And those kind of things you don't do. Um, but you focus on the things that, you know, that you enjoy doing and that might be harder you know, for you to find otherwise. And sometimes meat is, you can store meat, you know, in terms of, um, you know, freeze dried meat for a long time, but it's expensive and it's not expensive to raise it. 
if you have just a little piece of landmark, I mean, if you have not much, but enough to put, you know, a Dexter cow out there or something like that, uh, or put a couple of them, you've got milk, which you don't have to buy, and you have free beef because you process, you know, one steer every year and a half or something like that for your family, and, and that's it. You're good to go. So that's fresh meat that's free for you in addition to the venison and everything else that you have in your environment. And uh, once you come to that realization, you pick the things that make sense for you to buy, like, you know, the wheat and those kind of things, and, you know, versus the things that you can produce on your own. And you mentioned that the the modern homesteader uh, in general is also looking to still keep earning a living. Um, yeah, they want to unplug from the rat race, but not society altogether. I guess they're in, in a much better position to survive should uh, society go away. But while it's still here, why not take advantage of it? Uh, can you go in a little bit more depth in, in depth about uh, about the, the types of incomes that uh, the modern homesteader can can earn? You you mentioned a lot of online stuff, but now you had a, a artisan cheese business, and I think that you mentioned that earlier in the show. Can you go in a little more depth on that? Yeah, that I did. We we found that a farm that for years did um, grass fed meats. Um, and then we evolved that farm into a farmstead cheese business where we were milking Jersey cows. Um, and then we turned it into an artisan cheese business where we also bought milk and, um, you know, continued making cheese that, that would be sold in, you know, uh, Kroger, Whole Foods, source like that uh, throughout the southeast. And that was a, we, we evolved to that business because that business gave us more time with our young daughter than all the other farming kind of businesses. And the other thing is the, the profit margins of artisan cheese are, are way higher than, for example, let's say you want to sell um, eggs. I mean, a lot of people think they're going to go to the country and start a farm, and they're thinking they're going to sell eggs or something. Well, first of all, there's low barriers to entry for that. I mean, anybody can start with a few hens, you know, and, and selling eggs, so you've got a lot of competition. And, you know, the profit margins are really bad, you know, in that model, and it's very labor-intensive. Uh, conversely, you know, if you're going to go into artisan cheese, there's a big capital requirement. You've got to invest in it to do it, but that capital requirement um, also limits the competition that's out there. So it becomes a much more attractive business once you learn to do that. But after several years of doing that, again, on our path of really wanting to be homesteaders, Mark, we wanted to be homesteaders, not farmers for other people. That was the journey that we were on. We sold the artisan cheese business. Uh, to a couple that, you know, wanted to continue the the brand, the name, everything that we were doing and take over all the relationships. And, um, you know, they did that. And, you know, now we're focused on pulling back and raising all the same animals, but focused on our own, I guess, uh, self-sufficient preparedness. And did you go into the, the cheese business with that, that exit strategy in mind? Or was that just uh, as your goals evolved, that's what you decided to do? No. Yeah, it was accidental. Um, it was, it, it, you know, it, we've been on an evolution ever since we opted out. I think if, if, if somebody is frustrated with where they are in, um, let's call it normal society, they have a job that they have to go to, but maybe they don't love the job. Maybe it's a job that doesn't have a lot of meaning for them and they wish they had another life. And so they start on this path to another life, which is what we did. But we had no background in farming. I, mean, I, I never grew up on a farm. I I, like I said, I wrote for Fox Farm Magazine in high school, but that's just because they told me to do it. You know, and after that, I went to the corporate world. So my wife and I had no farming background, no knowledge of animals. We just went out and did it. But as we did that, we found we love the independent life. We love animals. We love livestock. We love raising them. But we didn't want to be farmers for other people because that took a lot of time for us. What well, We wanted time to spend with our daughter and to focus on our family and have more time for each other. So we became, we were more interested in homesteading and then finding creative ways to, if we wanted to continue to make money, to creative ways to continue to make money from home rather than making money by raising and selling, you know, uh, food products for other people. And uh, one of the things I consistently pre preach is financial preparedness. Do you think that's something that's uh, being overlooked as a, a general aspect of preparedness by most folks? Well, of course, I think every aspect of preparedness is overlooked by most folks. I mean, most people have absolutely um, no sense of preparedness. And now your audience, I'm sure, is different. Uh, they're either prepared or becoming prepared or inspired to be prepared. But, you know, uh, yeah, in, in a book I wrote last year called Start Prepping, I talked a lot about financial preparedness and the different 
um, phases of it and the and the different levels of it. It's not just gold and silver, the things that a lot of us think about, you know, in the preparedness community. That's, you know, to me, that's a small piece. Um, but having enough money put aside uh, for any emergency, having the final financial resources to buy some of the preparedness things that we want. For example, uh, you, you know, you might have a deep well and you might want a flow jack or you might want a simple pump or you might want to have something that's going to allow you to access water. Um, or you might want to have a water purifier, or you might want to buy these Mylar bags that I'm talking about. You know, all these things that we want to feel better about long-term preparedness, in our world, they cost money because I don't know many people that can make a Mylar bag. So, uh, you know, there's, there's a lot of people that can save garden seeds and then plant their garden next year, but not many of them can make the garden hose or the other things that they need, um, you know, to support aspects of their life. So, yeah, most people live week to week, you know, and, and the people I've been interviewing for my new podcast, a lot of them came from a world where they're making a lot of money. I mean, Mark, I know people, and it sounds crazy, and people think it's crazy when I say it, but I, I know people that make a half a million bucks a year and live week to week because the, the more money you make, the more you need that second and the third house and the boat and the, the additional cars and the travel and the, and the shiny objects and then the repairs on the shiny objects. So, you know, that money gets eaten up and, um, you know, they're just they're they're living week to week, no matter how much money somebody makes. Most of them are living week to week and not putting it aside. And the essence of financial preparedness is put some money aside for that proverbial rainy day. That's the end of the first half of my interview with Tim Young of SelfSufficientMan.com. Tune in next week for the rest of the show. If you're near Cincinnati, start making plans to come see me at the Cincy Preparedness Expo at the Sharonville Convention Center on October 15th and 16th. Besides all of the fantastic prepper gear available, it's a great place to learn vital survival skills. And make sure you stop by the Prepper Recon booth to say hi. Check out CincyPreparednessExpo.com for tickets and information.